Welcome, friends, to 10 a.m. worship at the Congregational Church of Amherst, United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, which means this. Whether you are on your couch or at your kitchen table or in your office or one of the five people here in this sanctuary this morning, whether you are in your Sunday best or in, still in last night's PJs, whether you are a member of this church or, or any church or none at all, you are so welcome to be here with us in worship today. This is our second ever computer church and we so appreciated your comments and affirmations about last week's inaugural live stream. Your CC Amherst staff are becoming more and more tech savvy by the minute over here. And so we invite you to keep your eye out for email updates, Facebook posts, and website announcements about programs we plan to reinvent for online participation to keep us all connected in this time of social distancing. Along those lines, you can find the bulletin for this morning's service at our website, ccamherst.org, at the bottom of the homepage under the title recent sermons under that header at the bottom of the page. This way you can follow along at home with us. Some things have had to be put on hold for the time being, namely our spring good stuff sale. Please hold your donations for the sale until the fall when we will have one great big, big stu good stuff extravaganza. It will be a huge celebration and we are looking forward to it. And finally, please continue to reach out to Pastor Maureen and myself with any joys and concerns or prayer requests you might be holding on your heart. Because we are live here on Facebook and therefore very public, we would love it if you would take a minute to indicate how you would like your prayer shared, either here live um, and how you would like the name stated or just for our congregational care email list. Either way is wonderful, and we are praying for all of you in this time of chaos. So now, let us be in a spirit of worship. I invite you all now, those who are here and those who are at home who might have seen the call to worship that have posted right before worship, to join together with us in body and in spirit wherever you are. Day by day, God leads us to, to the deep, deep, deep pools of peace, to the green, lush lawns of grace. Day by day, Jesus calls us to pour out ourselves in service, to anoint the stranger with hope. Day by day, the Spirit shows us the community we could be, the family we are called to become. Day by day, near and far, let us all be in a spirit of worship. We now lift up our prayer of invocation, and at the end of which I will invite you all to join together in the Lord's Prayer. And Holy God, we have not traveled very far to come to worship this morning. And yet we feel blessed to be gathered one spirit in Christ. Be with us, divine creator. Be with us wherever we are, in our sanctuary, in our living rooms, in our office nooks and kitchen islands and big comfy chairs. Open our minds to see your presence among us, moving in powerful ways at all times and in all places. Open our hearts to hear familiar words in new ways, ways that will change us and challenge us and comfort us. Grant us the power and courage to sit in the dark places with you, the one who shows us the way in hard times. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this is the time in our service where I would normally call all of you children up to the front and we'd pray over our offering and we'd be together. But I know that we are together in spirit, so kids out there, thank you for being with us and this is a time for you. So I thought I'd start our children's time today by reading our scripture for today. It's short, it's sweet, and it'll be good to hear twice. So let's listen to the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. So if I had you all here, I would ask you, what do you think this scripture is all about? And you would have very insightful answers that I am missing hearing. But since we are reaching out to each other via Facebook, I'm just going to answer my own question. This morning's scripture is about trusting God. It's about trusting God to handle all of the really hard, big, grown-up things that are going on. And knowing that God always has our back, even when things feel pretty scary. Right? But sometimes I think it is hard just to sit and wait for God and the grown-ups to figure things out. So this week I was thinking a little bit about some things we could do while we're waiting, right? I'm sure you guys have come up with a lot of great things to do at home, so I'm just going to give you one more idea. I was thinking that one thing we could do is tell other people how much we love and appreciate and miss them. So maybe today, or over the next week, you can get together with your family and make some homemade cards or drawings to send to some people. I made some of my own here. I've got a we miss you card and a thank you card. And I did a little drawing that I might send to my grandma. Yeah, here we go. Um, and I was thinking that you could send or a drawing or a card to some of the emergency medical doctors and emergency responders and nurses in our state and our whole region and our whole country who are working really hard to keep us safe and healthy. And I was also thinking that if you're old enough to write, you could write them a little note and tell them what you're doing to help and how old you are and how your family is doing. You could tell them that you're staying home and washing your hands really hard, which is a huge help, right? We all know that. And then I was thinking you could also send some cards or pictures or notes to other members of our church that you would see normally, but you aren't seeing right now so that everyone can stay safe and healthy. And you could tell them that you miss them and that you hope that they are staying safe and healthy too. Maybe you have one of these green directories at home, right? And if not, you can actually access it now on our new website. And so you could get your parents to go in and type in their credentials and pull up the directory. And you could look through the directory and find someone that you recognize the name of or someone even that you don't, right? And you could send them a note or a letter or a picture that you drew. And this is one way we can all stay connected with one another. And you adults can do that too, actually, believe it or not. But the most important thing to know is that there are things that we cannot control, right? And those things are the things that we can talk about with adults that we trust and with God, right? And we can trust those adults and God to take care of them over time. And then there are things that we can do to help, like washing our hands and staying home and reaching out to one another. So this is just one idea, but if you come up with other ideas, I'm going to invite you to ask your parents to maybe write it in the comments on this Facebook video, or ask your parents to send me or Maureen an email, or you can send us a letter and let us know how you're doing 
and how your heart is today. So that's my message for you guys this morning, and we're going to do one of these every week until we can be together again. So let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for all of the children of this church. Thank you for their presence with us in spirit this morning. Bless them, keep them safe and healthy and happy in this new time, and show them ways that they can show your light to the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so now it's time to pass the peace. So I'll invite you to stand up and, you know, maybe you're shaking your own hand and that's good and you can know that everyone here is sending our love to you or you can turn to your family or your partner and shake their hand or, you know, maybe do this, right? And say, the peace of God be with you. And we'll all say, and also, and also with, with you. you. All right, have we all passed the piece? I think it's a little bit of a shorter time now than it used to be. So let us uh, move into our time of sermon and scripture. I'll start with our scripture intro this morning. So here we are, friends, week four of a seven-ish Lent week Lenten journey. And oh boy, are we in the wilderness this year, right? In this unknown time, which is a time that's supposed to be for exploring the unknown anyways, the lectionary, which is, um, we've talked about this a little bit before, this is the tool that Maureen and I use, that many churches all over the world use, to guide us in what scriptures to preach each week. The lectionary has given us a gift, the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm is maybe the most well-known Bible passage of all time. And definitely the most famous psalm, right? I bet you knew it instantly when I read it earlier for the kids. Or at least remember hearing it in a graveside scene in a movie once. This is a scripture passage that touches many of our hearts. Even though it uses language that is antiquated in our day, not many of us know actual shepherds or anoint ourselves with oil anymore. It still speaks to our spirits especially in times of distress, of sorrow, and of grief. And so I'm not going to over-explain this passage this morning. But what I will say before we hear it once again is that this is what scholars call a psalm of trust. There are several, several psalms of trust in the book of Psalms. Psalms are actually songs, and they would have been sung rather than read long ago. And so as you listen to this familiar passage, imagine it as a song, a song about trusting God, no matter what the circumstances are. Now hear the words of the psalmist and listen for the word of God. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Okay, before we get started here, I want everyone to take a deep cleansing breath. We're going to take a deep breath together that goes all the way down into our tummies and then all the way back out. This is one way that we can remind our brains that we are all right. Okay, ready? 
Let's inhale for one, two, three, four, five, and hold it. And exhale for five, four, three, two, one. Let us pray. Spirit God, be with us in this moment as we hear the story of your people in times like this one and how they prayed when they came through on the other side. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts bring us closer to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, so I want you to picture this. The Israelites, hold on, I'm just gonna, there we go. The Israelites, God's chosen people, are out in the wilderness on their 40 year journey to find the promised land. It's year 10 of this four decade trek. 10 years ago, the Israelites escaped the tyranny of Egypt that malicious place where they were enslaved and worked to the bone, where they saw God send plagues of locusts and frogs and bloodshed for their freedom, where they banded together to bake bread and hustle out into the middle of the night with angels before their eyes and at their heels they ran straight through a huge river without even getting wet, and their enemies were overthrown, washed out in the waves behind them, and they ran into the wilderness, looking for the promised land, looking for Canaan. But it's year 10 now, and the novelty of that amazing journey has worn off. The excitement that started their path to freedom feels like a fairy tale that the fixers, I think you know what I mean by fixer, those folks who try to make a bad thing all better, by telling a story of that one time they went through a bad thing and it turned out so dang miraculous or something. Those people who are sometimes us, right? Sometimes it's us, who just can't sit with hard feelings and so they try to solve the unsolvable feeling, especially feelings of pain or fear. The Israelites' journey out of Egypt seems now like a story that the fixers use to try to inspire shallow optimism in the face of desperation, fear, and want. It's year 10, and all the Israelites know is that they want. Oh, how badly do they want, right? They want meat and water and wine. They want a place to call home that isn't so damn sandy or dry or lonely. They keep calling out to Moses, Moses, where is God? Why have you brought us here to die? Why is this happening to us? When you showed us that map to Canaan back in Egypt, it didn't seem this far away. Are we there yet? The Israelites are in a valley. When they look behind, all they see are the mistakes and wrong turns they made along the way to get them here. And when they look ahead, they see no end in sight. No green pastures or still waters. No higher ground that will get them out of this valley of despair. And they are afraid. And all they can do is keep walking. I tell you all this because this is the story that inspired our psalmist when she wrote the song we read today. Or at least one of the stories. This is one of the stories that the psalmist looked to when she prayed, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And though I walk through the darkest valley, I shall fear no evil. And goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life. You'll notice that I said pursue, not follow. Usually we hear that phrase from this psalm translated, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. But the Hebrew word the psalmist uses is radaf, which is translated pursue over and over in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. When talking about the enemies of God's people, right? In Exodus, we hear the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil of my desire, shall have its fill of them. 
I will draw my sword, and my hand shall destroy them. In the Psalms, then let the enemy pursue and overtake me, trample my life to the ground. And from the prophet Hosea, Israel has spurned the good, the enemy shall pursue him. Psalm 23 turns the idea of an enemy who pursues a pretty scary image into something good and life-affirming. The psalmist is reminding us that no matter where evil and despair is, there God is too, pursuing goodness and mercy for our lives. Because we know that despair is real and present, right? Nowhere have we been promised that we will not struggle at times, that we will not lose or grieve. And like the people of Israel, that makes us afraid, right? I'm afraid. I bet we all are a little afraid. It's natural. We're afraid of getting sick, of losing the ones we love, of another recession or depression, of the things that we cannot control. In my mind, our psalm today was clearly written on the other side of the dark valley because their fearlessness and insight seems like it comes from experience. From the experience of walking through that valley of the shadow of death and coming out on the other side. This story of the Israelites is the one the psalmist remembers because the Israelites eventually, after 30 more years, after more hardship and pain, and it must be said, relentless courage, do get to the promised land. And here's what they learned. When they look back on their 40 years in the wilderness, their 40 years looking for the promised land, they see that God was with them every step of the way. They remember how manna fell from the sky right when they needed bread the most. They remember the quail that came out of nowhere when they were starving for protein and sick to death of weird heaven bread. They remember the water that came out of the rock when they thought they were going to die of dehydration. They remember how God promised to provide and then did. They also remember the pain of that time. They remember the sores on their feet and the heartbreak of homelessness. They remember being scared and wondering if they would ever get reestablished, if they would ever have their feet on the ground. They remember facing their enemies, enemies of greed and fear and self-righteousness and depression and overcoming them one by one. They remember that the wilderness did not kill them. They remember how God didn't abandon them even when they were being their worst selves, even when they were shaking their fists at the skies and threatening to abandon God and worship something else altogether. God still led them like a shepherd, anointing their heads with oil, laying a table before them. And when they look back on the wilderness, they find that what they learned made them stronger. They learned that they had to share and love one another to get by. They learned how their community was their life-saving grace in the desert. They find that they learned how to trust God far more in the darkness, in the hardest times, than they ever would have in the easier ones. They found that giving God their trust is a much truer way to love God than offering tokens of their affection before a man-made altar. They found that there is no substitute for a belief that is strengthened by trial and experience. They learned that in their search for the promised land, they were already in a time of not knowing how grave or how long this crisis will go. It will likely be weeks before we know how this pandemic will resolve for us and for our country. And as anyone who has waited for a diagnosis or a test result will tell you, the not knowing can be the very hardest part. We don't know, we don't really know what all this means yet. 
It is too early to make meaning of all this, but it is not too early to rest in and rely on the stories of our ancestors. Our faithful predecessors walked through their own valleys and found that God was by their side the whole way, anointing them not just on the easy days, but on all of the days of their lives. We can listen to their stories. And it's also not too soon to learn from their hard-won lessons. They warn us, don't dwell on past mistakes or jump to hasty conclusions. Don't abandon ship. Love your neighbor as yourself. Be not afraid. Remember, beloveds, we were made for such a time as this. And as we navigate this bleak time together, we are called to look for the love and light of God in ourselves, in one another, and in the world. And of course, to keep on walking until we get to the other side. Thanks be to God, and amen. Often in times of crisis like this, we ask, where is God? Well, I'm here to tell you that God is in you, and God is in those gathered around you right now. God is in your family and friends. God is in your neighbor. God is in the stranger, the people you don't even know. God is in all of us. Because God has, is and has always been working through us. We are the presence of God in the world. So God is in our phone calls and in our letters and in our delivered meals and all the ways we reach out to one another, especially in this time when we can't really be together or touch one another. 
So wherever you are, I invite you to be gathered together in the spirit of prayer as we be this presence of God for one another. This morning, I'd like to lift up prayers of sympathy for Tim Wiegan and his family. Tim's father, Richard Wiegan, passed away on Friday in Wellington, Ohio, and he was 91 years old. Now, a funeral will take place this Thursday in Ohio, and thankfully, it will be live streamed, so Tim and his family, all their gathered family, can watch it from afar. So may we hold the Wiegan family in our prayers. And God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. A prayer from Cynthia, prayers for her mother, Ruth, who is recovering from back surgery. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. From Leona, prayers for my cousin Emily and her husband, Lenny, who recently had twins. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we lift up prayers for our world as we collectively respond to this unprecedented spread of the coronavirus. We pray for strength and healing and an influx of resources for those areas that have seen their population and their healthcare facilities overwhelmed, especially in China, in Italy, and Spain, and right here in our own country in New York and California and Washington and all of our 50 states. We pray for the medical professionals. We pray for the grieving. We pray for all of us. And God, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. And I invite you now, in your homes or wherever you're gathered, to lift up those prayers in voice that you have on your heart or just in the silence between yourself and God. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God of all times and all places and all that is, we can feel you with us in this time, in this place, in all that is right now. We feel you in this moment, wherever we may be, in our homes, in our work, walking in the world while we still can. We hear you in the familiar sounds of this space, in this creaking floor, in the ticking clock, the echo of voices raised in prayer, in word, and in song, in the bells that we hear now at a distance, but still they ring. This is the space where we come to find you on Sunday morning. We can close our eyes and see the sun dappling the sanctuary walls. We can see the worn and scuffed floor at our feet. We can see the faces of the children peering over the pews. We can feel the smoothness of the wood, the heft of the hymnals and the Bibles in our hands, the warm handshakes and hugs offered up as we pass the peace the peace that we long to feel once again, the peace of one another's presence, the peace of knowing that all will be well, the peace of routine and ritual, of looking ahead to a Monday morning filled with school buses and coffee commutes and WA meetings and the rhythm of the world settling back into the worn and familiar grooves of living and being. Compassionate God, we pray for all of those settling into new routines, for parents and children learning how to separate work and play within the same space, for teachers and administrators learning how to educate from afar, for businesses and organizations learning how to serve and survive in creative and unexpected ways. We pray for those whose new routines have brought unanticipated stress and risk. Those working in grocery stores and pharmacies and 
other businesses deemed essential for all of us. Police officers and EMTs and other first responders who are still responding to traffic accidents and domestic incidences and heart attack scares as, as they always have and always will. And we pray for our healthcare professionals working night and day with too many patients and not nearly enough supplies, with too much uncertainty, too much fear, too much pain, and not enough hours or shoulder strength to carry it all. We pray for those who have lost their work in restaurants and movie theaters and hair salons and sports arenas and art museums all those places deemed non-essential in the moment. Dear God, we breathe all of this. We breathe it in not knowing when we will be able to exhale, not knowing when we will be able to leave our homes and stop being afraid of unclean doorknobs and unsatisfied spaces. We will no longer hear about projected new cases and the phrase social distancing will be but a distant memory. But God of all times, we are not there yet, but we will be. And in this time, in this liminal time, in this in between what was before and what will be, you are with us, lifting us up and holding us up you are the very ground beneath our feet. The wind that flows around us, the sky which bends above us, the all-encompassing embrace of creation. And we fall into that embrace, O oh God, trusting that you will catch us and hold us and comfort us. Regardless of what is to come, Regardless of how dark and shadowed the valley is before us, you are with us. Your guiding rod and your shepherd staff, they comfort us. You lay us down to sleep in green pastures. You lead us beside still waters and you restore our souls. You are our God, our creator and comforter. And you are big enough to carry all that we cannot. So we leave all of this with you. In this moment, in this space, the uncertainty, the unknowing, the unfamiliar, the unexpected. And we walk together into the next moment, knowing that you are with us all the days of our lives. Amen. This is the time in our service when we ask for our offering for the many ways that we have to give back to God and give back to this church and this community. And we will still do so from afar because the many things that we do here together as a church, all the missions that we have joined together to help those outside these walls and within these walls are still ongoing and will continue to be ongoing because this too shall pass and there will come a time when we will gather together again and do the work of this church as we are still doing now. So it's just a reminder of the many ways that we do that. We have our stewardship campaign ongoing right now and next Sunday as we gather is still Faith Promise Sunday. This is the time when we ask you to pledge your time, your talent or your treasure to our community for the coming year. So those of you who are members of this church or friends of this church, you've gotten those stewardship letters and we ask you to fill those out and mail those back to the church and we will celebrate our Faith Promise Sunday next Sunday as we always do. 
And I also want to lift up our deacons who this time of year pass those Easter baskets. It's our way of collecting money so we can help those outside of our church in need by delivering an Easter basket on, East, on the week before Easter Sunday. So they will have a meal or a gift card to buy a meal. So if you would like to give to our, our deacons Easter basket fund, please do so by mailing a check to the church you can also go to our website and give online. And for your pledge, you can also do the same, mail a check to the church or give online. So we invite you to give in these many ways to support the work that we do in God's name. So let us pray. Gracious and generous God, we come to your altar in thanksgiving for all that you have given us. We bring our offerings with full intent to love our neighbors as ourselves and return that love you have so lavishly bestowed upon us. Unite us with one another in your ministry of reconciliation. Unite us from afar because together we are the one body of Christ in your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, it has been so good to worship with you this morning. As you leave this space, may you go from here loving God so much that you love nothing else too much and fearing God just enough that you fear nothing else at all. And may the blessings of God, our creator, Christ, our brother and savior, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.